Chapter Six of the Wheat Princess by Jean Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the morning after their arrival, Marcia had risen early and set out on horseback to explore the neighborhood. As Castel Vivalanti accordingly was engaged in its usual Saturday morning sweeping, a clatter of horses' hoofs suddenly sounded on the tiny corso. The paving is so villainous that a single horse, however daintily it may step, sounds like a cavalcade and running to the door the inhabitants of the village beheld the new signorina americana gaily riding up the narrow way and smiling to the right and left for all the world like the queen herself the women contented themselves with standing in the doorways and staring open-mouthed but the children ran boldly after until the signorina presently dismounted and bidding the groom hold her horse sat down upon the doorstep and talked to them with as much friendliness as though she had known them all her life she ended by asking them what in the world they liked best to eat and they declared in a single voice for socolata accordingly they moved in a body to the baker's and to domenico's astonishment ordered all of the chocolate in the shop and while he was excitedly counting it out the signorina kept talking to him about the weather and the scenery and the olive crop until he was so overcome by the honour that he could do nothing but bob his head and murmur si si excellenza si si excellenza to everything she said and as soon as she had mounted her horse again and ridden away with a final wave of her hand to the little black-eyed children domenico hurried to the crocedoro to inform the landlord that he had also had the honour of entertaining the signorina americana who had bought chocolate to the amount of five lira five lira and had given it all away the blacksmith's wife who had followed domenico to hear the news remarked that for her part she thought it a sin to spend so much for chocolate the signorina might have given the money just as well and they could have had meat for sunday but domenico was more ready this time to condone the fault si si he returned with a nod of his head the signorina meant well no doubt but she could not understand the needs of poor people he supposed that they lived on chocolate all the time at the villa and naturally did not realize that persons who worked for their living found meat more nourishing when marcia returned home with the announcement that she had visited castel vivalanti her uncle replied with an elaborate frown i suppose you scattered soldi broadcast through the streets and have started fifty young italians on the broad road to pauperism not a single soldo she reassured him i distributed nothing more demoralizing than a few cakes of chocolate you'll make a scientific philanthropist if you keep on mr copley laughed but his inner reflections coincided somewhat with those of the blacksmith's wife marcia's explorations were likewise extended in other directions and before the first week was over she had visited most of the villages from palestrina to subiaco as a result the chief article of diet in the sabine mountains bade fair to become sweet chocolate while domenico the baker instead of being grateful for this unexpected flow of custom complained to his friends of the trouble it caused no sooner would he send into rome for a fresh supply than the signorina would come and carry the whole of it off at that rate it was clearly impossible to keep it in stock by means of largesses of chocolate to the children or possibly by a smile and a friendly air marcia had established in a very short time a speaking acquaintance with the whole neighbourhood and on sunny mornings as she rode between the olive orchards and the wheat-fields more than one worker straightened his back to call a pleased buona passeggiata signorina to the fair-haired stranger princess who came from the land across the water where it was rumoured gold could be dug from the ground like potatoes and every one was rich all about the region the advent of the foreigners was a subject of chief interest especially because they were americani for many of the people were thinking of becoming americani themselves the servants of the villa when they condescended to drink a glass of wine at the inn of the crocedoro were almost objects of veneration because they could talk so intimately of the life these stranger princes led the stranger princes would have been astonished could they have heard some of the details of these recitals and so the copley dynasty began at castel vivalanti the life soon fell into a daily routine as life in even the best of places will three meals and tea a book in the shadiness of the ilex grove to the tune of the splashing fountain a siesta at noon a drive in the afternoon and a long night's sleep were the sum of vivalanti's resources marcia liked it italy had got its hold upon her and for the present she was content to drift but mr copley after a few days of lounging on the balustrade smoking countless cigarettes 
and hungrily reading such newspapers as drifted out on the somewhat casual mails had his horse saddled one morning and rode to palestrina to the station after that he went into rome almost every day and the peasants in the wayside vineyards came to know him as well as his niece but they did not take off their hats and smile as they did to her for he rode past with unseeing eyes rich men they said had no thought for such as they and they turned back to their work with a sullen scowl work at the best is hard enough and it is a pity when the smile that makes it lighter is withheld howard copley would have been the last to do it had he realized but his thoughts were bent on other things and how could the peasants know that while he galloped by so carelessly his mind was planning a way to get them bread marcia spent many half-hours the first few weeks in loitering about the ruins of the old villa it was a dream-haunted spot which spoke pathetically of a bygone time with bygone ideals she could never quite reconcile the crumbling arches the fantastic rock-work and the grass-grown terraces with the young italy of montecitorio thirty miles away to eyes fresh from the new world it seemed half unreal one afternoon she had started to walk across the fields to castel vivalanti but the fields had proved too sunny and she had stopped in the shade of the cypresses instead even the ruins seemed to be revivified by the warm touch of spring blue and white anemones rose-coloured cyclamen yellow laburnum burst from every cranny of the stones marcia glanced about with an air of delighted approval a pan with his pipes was all that was needed to make the picture complete she dropped down on the coping of the fountain and with her chin in her hands gazed dreamily at the moss-bearded merman who two centuries before had spouted water from his twisted conch shell she was suddenly startled from her reverie by hearing a voice exclaim buon giorno signorina and she looked up quickly to find paul dessart mr dessart she cried in amazement where in the world did you come from the inn of st agapito at palestrina benoit and i are making it to the centre of a sketching expedition we get a sort of hail fever every spring and when the disease reaches a certain point we pack up and set out for the sabines and how did you manage to find us purely chance he returned more or less truthfully i picked out this road as a promising field and when i came to the gateway being an artist i couldn't resist the temptation of coming in i didn't know that it was villa vivalanti or that i should find you here he sat down on the edge of the fountain and looked about well marcia inquired i don't wonder that you wanted to exchange rome for this may i make a little sketch and will you stay and talk to me until it is finished that depends upon how long it takes you to make a little sketch i shall subscribe to no carte blanche promises he got out a box of water-colours from one pocket of his norfolk jacket and a large pad from the other and having filled his cup at the little rush-choked stream which once had fed the fountain set to work without more ado i heard from the roystons this morning said marcia presently and immediately she was sorry that she had not started some other subject in their former conversations paul's relations with his family had never proved a very fortunate topic any bad news he inquired flippantly they will reach rome in a week or so holy week i might have known it miss copley he looked at her appealingly you know what an indefatigable woman my aunt is she will make me escort her to every religious function that blessed city offers it isn't her way to miss anything marcia smiled slightly at the picture it was lifelike i shall be stopping in palestrina when they come he added she let this observation pass in a disapproving silence oh well he sighed i'll stay and tote them around if you think i ought the bible says you know love your relatives and show mercy on to them that despitefully use you marcia flashed a sudden laugh and then looked grave paul glanced up at her quickly i suppose my aunt told you no end of bad things about me was there anything to tell he shrugged his shoulders i've committed the unpardonable sin of preferring art in rome to coal in pittsburgh he dropped the subject and turned back to his picture and marcia sat watching him as he industriously splashed in colour occasionally their eyes met when he raised his head and if his own lingered a moment longer than convention warranted being an artist he was excusable for she was distinctly an addition to the moss-covered fountain the young man may have prolonged the situation somewhat in any case the sun's rays were beginning to slant when he finally pocketed his colours and presented the picture with a bow 
it was a dainty little sketch of a ruined grotto and a broken statue with the sunlight flickering through the trees on the flower-sprinkled grass really is it for me she asked it's lovely mr dessart and when i go away from rome i can remember both you and the villa by it when you go away he asked with a notable note of anxiety in his voice but i thought you had come to live with your uncle oh for the present she returned but i'm going back to america in the indefinite future he breathed an exaggerated sigh of relief the indefinite future doesn't bother me before it comes you'll change your mind everybody does it's merely the present i want to be sure of marcia glanced at him a moment with a half provocative laugh and then without responding she turned her head and appeared to study the stone village up on the height she was quite conscious that he was watching her and she was equally conscious that her pale blue muslin gown and her rosebud hat formed an admirable contrast to the frowning old merman when she turned back there was a shade of amusement in her glance paul did not speak but he did not lower his eyes nor in any degree veil his visible admiration she rose with a half shrug and brushed back a stray lock of hair that was blowing in her eyes i'm hungry she remarked in an exasperatingly matter-of-fact tone let's go back and get some tea will mrs copley receive a jacket and knickerbockers mrs copley will be delighted visitors are a godsend at villa vivalanti they passed from the deep shade of the cypresses to the sun-flecked laurel path that skirted the wheat-field as they strolled along in no great hurry to reach the villa they laughed and chatted lightly but the most important things they said occurred in the pauses when no words were spoken the young man carried his hat in his hand carelessly switching the branches with it as he passed his shining light brown hair almost the colour of marcia's own lay on his forehead in a tangled mass and stirred gently in the wind she noted it in an approving sidewise glance and quickly turned away again lest he should look up and catch her eyes upon him in the ilex grove they paused for a moment as the sound of mingled voices reached them from the terrace listen marcia whispered with her finger on her lips and as she recognized the tones she made a slight grimace my two enemies the contessa torranieri and mr sybert the contessa has a villa at tivoli this is very kind of her is it not nine miles is a long distance just to pay a call as they advanced toward the tea-table placed under the trees at the end of the terrace they found an unexpectedly august party not only the contessa torrianeri and the secretary of the embassy but the american consul-general as well the men had evidently but just arrived as mrs copley was still engaged with their welcome mr melville you come at exactly the right time we are having mushroom ragout to-night which if i remember is your favourite dish but why didn't you bring your wife my wife my dear lady is at present in capri and shows no intention of coming home your husband pitying my loneliness insisted on bringing me out for the night i am glad that he did we shall hope to see you later however when mrs melville can come too mr sybert she added turning toward the younger man you can't know how we miss not having you drop in at all hours of the day we didn't realize what a necessary member of the family you had become until we had to do without you marcia overhearing this speech politely suppressed a smile as she presented the young painter he was included in the general acclaim this is charming mrs copley declared i was just complaining to the contessa torranieri that not a soul had visited us since we came out to the villa and here are three almost before the words are out of my mouth pietro appearing with the tray full of cups put an end to these amenities and reinforced by gerald they had an unusually festive tea-party mr copley had once remarked concerning paul de sart that he would be an ornament to any dinner-table and he undoubtedly proved himself an ornament to-day melville introducing the subject of a famous monastery lately suppressed by the government gave rise to a discussion involving many and various opinions the contessa and de sart hotly defended the homeless monks while the other men from a political point of view were inclined to applaud the action of the premier their arguments were strong but the little contessa two slender hands gesticulating excitedly staunchly held her own though a white in politics her sympathies on occasion stuck persistently to the other side the church had owned the property for five centuries the government for a quarter of a century which had the better right and aside from the justice of the question dessart backed her up 
for ascetic reasons alone the monks should be allowed to stay who wished to have the beauties of frescoed chapels and carved choir stalls pointed out by blue uniformed government officials whose coats didn't fit it spoiled the poetry names of cardinals and prelates and italian princes passed glibly and the politicians finally retired beaten marcia listening thought approvingly that the young artist was a match for the diplomats and she could not help but acknowledge further that whatever faults the contessa might possess dullness was not among them it was gerald however who furnished the chief diversion that afternoon upon being forbidden to take a third maritozzo he rose reluctantly shook the crumbs from his blouse and drifted off toward the ilex grove to occupy himself with the collection of lizards which he kept in a box under a stone garden seat the group about the tea-table was shortly startled by a splash and a scream and they hastened with one accord to the scene of the disaster mr copley arriving first was in time to pluck his son from the fountain like achilles by a heel what's the matter howard mrs copley called as the others anxiously hurried up nothing serious he reassured her gerald has merely been trying to identify himself with his environment gerald dripping and sputtering came out at this point with the astounding assertion that marietta had pushed him in marietta chimed into the general confusion with a volley of latin ejaculations she push him in madonna mia what a fib why should she do such a thing when it would only put her to the trouble of dressing him again she had told him repeatedly not to fall into the fountain but the moment her back was turned he disobeyed amid a chorus of laughter and suggestions of wails and protestations the nurse the boy and his father and mother set out for the house to settle the question leaving the guests at the scene of the tragedy as they strolled back to the terrace the contessa very adroitly held sybert on one side and dessart on the other while with a great deal of animation and gesture she recounted a diverting bit of roman gossip melville and marcia followed after the latter with a speculative eye on the group in front and an amused appreciation of the fact that the young artist would very much have preferred dropping behind possibly the contessa divined this too in any case she held him fast the consul-general was discussing a criticism he had recently read of the american diplomatic service and his opinion of the writer was vigorous melville's views were likely to be both vigorously conceived and vigorously expressed in any case he summed up his remarks america has no call to be ashamed of her representative to italy his excellency is a fine example of the right man in the right place and his excellency's nephew she inquired her eyes on the lounging figure in front of them is an equally fine example of the right man in the wrong place i thought you were one of the people who stood up for him you thought i was one of the people who stood for him well certainly why not melville's tone contained the suggestion of challenge he had fought so many battles in sybert's behalf that a belligerent attitude over the question had become subconscious oh i don't know said marcia vaguely lots of people don't like him melville struck a match lit a cigar and vigorously puffed it into a glow then he observed lots of people are idiots marcia laughed and apologized excuse me but you are all so funny about mr sybert one day i hear the most extravagant things in his praise and the next the most disparaging things in his dispraise it's difficult to know what to believe of such a changeable person as that just let me tell you one thing miss marcia and that is that in this world a man who has no enemies is not to be trusted i don't know how it may be in the world to come as for sybert you may safely believe what his friends say of him in that case he certainly does not show his best side to the world he probably thinks his best side nobody's business but his own and then as a thought reoccurred to him he glanced at her a moment in silence while a brief smile flickered across his aggressively forceful face she could not interpret the smile but it was vaguely irritating and as she did not have anything further to say she pursued her theme roughshod when you see a person who doesn't take any interest in his own country whose only aim is to be thought a cosmopolitan a man of the world whose business in life is to attend social functions and make after-dinner speeches well naturally you can't blame people for not taking him very seriously she finished with a gesture of disdain you were telling me a little while ago miss marcia about some of the people in castel vivalanti 
you appear to be rather proud of your broad-mindedness in occasionally being able to detect the real man underneath the peasant don't you think you might push your penetration just one step further and discover a real man a personality beneath the man of the world once in a while it exists you can't argue me into liking mr sybert she laughed uncle howard has tried it and failed mr and mrs copley returned shortly to their guests and the contessa bemoaning the nine miles announced that she must go mr copley suggested that nine miles would be no longer after dinner than before but the lady was obdurate and her carriage was ordered she took her departure amid a graceful flurry of farewell the contessa had an unerring instinct for effect and her exits and her entrances were divertingly spectacular she bade mrs copley marcia and the consul-general good-bye upon the terrace and trailed across the marble flagging attended at a careful distance from her train by the three remaining men sybert handed her into the carriage dessart arranged the lap-robe while copley brought up the rear gingerly bearing her lace parasol with a gay little tilt of her white plumed hat toward the group on the terrace and an all-inclusive flash of black eyes she was finally off followed by the courtly bows of her three cavaliers marcia with sybert and dessart on either hand continued to stroll up and down the terrace while her aunt and uncle entertained melville amid the furnished comfort of the loggia sybert would ordinarily have joined the group on the loggia but he happened to be in the middle of a discussion with dessart regarding the new and according to most people scandalous proposition for leavening the seven hills the two men seemed to be diametrically opposed to all their views and were equally far apart in the methods of arguing dessart would lunge into flights of exaggerated rhetoric piling up adjectives and metaphors until by sheer weight he had carried his listeners off their feet while sybert with a curt phrase would knock the cornerstone from under the finished edifice the latter's method of fencing had always irritated marcia beyond measure he had a fashion of stating his point and then abandoning his adversary's eloquence in mid-air as if it were not worth his while to argue further to-day having come to a deadlock in the matter of piano regalatore they dropped the subject and pausing by the terrace parapet they stood looking down on the plain below dessart scanned it eagerly with eyes quick to catch every contrast and tone he noted the varying purples of the distance the narrow ribbon of glimmering gold where sky and plain met sea the misty whiteness of rome the sharply cut outline of monte soracte it was perfect as a picture composition perspective cutter scheme nothing might be bettered he sighed a contented sigh even i he murmured couldn't suggest a single change a slight smile crept over sybert's sombre face i could suggest a number the young painter brought a reproachful gaze to bear upon him ah he agreed and i can imagine the direction they'd take miss copley he added turning to marcia let me tell you of the thing i saw the other day on the roman campagna a sight which was enough to make a right-minded man sick i saw there was a tragic pause a mccormick reaper and binder sybert uttered a short laugh i am glad that you did and i only wish it were possible for one to see more man man you don't know what you are saying paul cried there were tears in his voice a mccormick reaper i tell you painted red and yellow and blue the man who did it should have been compelled to drink his paint marcia laughed and he added disgustedly the thing sows and reaps and binds all at once one shudders to think of its activities and that in the agra romana which picturesque peasants have spaded and planted and mowed by hand for thousands of years not however a particularly economical way of cultivating the campagna sybert observed economical way of cultivating the campagna dessart repeated the words with a groan is there no place in the world sacred to beauty must america flood every corner of the habitable globe with reapers and sewing machines and trolley cars the way they're sophisticating these adorably antique peasants is criminal that's the way it seems to me marcia agreed cordially uncle howard says they haven't enough to eat but they certainly do look happy and they don't look thin i can't help believing he exaggerates the trouble an italian miss copley who doesn't know where his next meal is coming from will lie on his back in the sunshine thinking how pretty the sky looks and he will get as much pleasure from the prospects as he would from his dinner if that isn't the art of being happy i don't know what is and that is why i hate to have italy spoiled 
well dessart i fancy we all hate that sybert returned though i am afraid we should quarrel over definitions he stretched out his hand toward the west where the plain joined the sea by the ruins of ostia and the pontine marshes it was a great barren desolate waste unpeopled uncultivated fever-stricken don't you think it would be a rather fine thing he asked to see that land drained and planted and lived on again as it was perhaps two thousand years ago marcia shook her head i should rather have it left just as it is possibly a few might gain but think of the poetry and the picturesqueness and the romance that the many would lose once in a while mr sybert it seems as if utility might give way to poetry especially on the roman campagna it is more fitting that it should be desolate and bare with only a few wandering shepherds and herds and no buildings but ruined towers and latin tombs a sort of burial place for ancient rome the living have a few rights even in rome they seem to have a good many dessart agreed oh i know what you reformers want you'd like to see the city full of smokestacks and machinery and the campagna laid out in garden plots and everybody getting good wages and six per cent interest with all the people dressed alike in ready-made clothing instead of peasant costume and nobody poor and nobody picturesque sybert did not reply for a moment as with half-shut eyes he studied the distance he was thinking of a ride he had taken three days before he had gone out with a hunting party to one of the great campagna estates owned by a roman prince whose only interest in the land was to draw from it every possible centesimi of income they had stopped to water their horses at a cluster of straw huts where the farm labourers lived and sybert had dismounted and gone into one of them to talk to the people it was dark and damp with a dirt floor and rude bunks along the sides there fifty human beings lived crowded together breathing the heavy pestilential air they had come down to bands from their mountain homes searching for work and had sold their lives to the prince for thirty cents a day the picture flashed across him now of their pale apathetic faces of the dumb reproach in their eyes and for a second he felt tempted to describe it but with the reflection that neither of the two before him would care any more about it than had the landlord prince he changed his expression into a careless shrug it will be some time before we'll see that he answered dessart's speech but you'd like it wouldn't you marcia persisted yes wouldn't you no she laughed i can't say that i should i decidedly prefer the peasants as they are they are far more attractive when they are poor and since they are happy in spite of it i don't see why it is our place to object sybert eyed the pavement impassively a moment then he raised his head and turned to marcia he swept her a glance from head to foot which took in every detail of her dainty gown her careless grace as she leaned against the balustrade and he made no endeavour to conceal the look of critically cold contempt in his eyes marcia returned his glance with an air of angry challenge not a word was spoken but it was an open declaration of war End of chapter six chapter seven of the wheat princess this librivox recording is in the public domain the roystons approached rome by easy stages along the riviera and as their prospective movements were but vaguely outlined even to themselves they suffered their approach to remain unheralded paul dessart since his talk with marcia had taken a little dip into the future with the result that he had decided to swallow any hurt feelings he might possess and pay dutiful court to his relatives the immediate rewards of such a course were evident one sunny morning early in april he had been right in his forecast of the time palm sunday loomed a week ahead a carriage drew up before the door of his studio and mrs royston and the mrs royston alighted squabbled with the driver over the fare and told him he need not wait they rang the bell and during the pause that followed stood upon the doorstep dubiously scanning the neighbourhood it was one of the narrow tortuous streets between the corso and the river a street of many colours and many smells with party-coloured washings fluttering from the windows with pretty tumble-haired children in gold earrings and shockingly scanty clothing sprawling underfoot the house itself presented a blank face of peeling stucco to the street with nothing but the heavily barred windows below and an ornamental cornice four stories up to suggest that it had once been a palace and a stronghold mrs royston turned from her inspection of the street to ring the bell again there was this time a suggestion of impatience in her touch a second wait and the door was finally opened by one of the fantastic little shepherd models 
who haunt the spanish steps he took off his hat with a polite permesso signore as he darted up the stairs ahead of them to point the way and open the door at the top they arrived at the end of the five flights somewhat short of breath and were ushered into a swept and garnished workroom where paul in a white blouse his sleeves rolled to the elbows was immersed in a large canvas almost too preoccupied to look up he received his relatives with an air of delighted surprise stood quite still while his aunt implanted a ponderous kiss upon his cheek and after a glance at his cousins kissed them of his own accord mrs royston sat down and surveyed the room it was irreproachably workmanlike and had been so for a week visibly impressed she transferred her gaze to her nephew paul you are improved she said at length my dear aunt i am five years older than i was five years ago well with a sigh of relief i actually believe you are paul i had no idea you were such a desirable cousin was margaret's frank comment as she returned from an inspection of the room to a reinspection of him eleanor said you were puffed velveteen trousers you don't do you never had a pair of puffed velveteen trousers in my life oh yes you did said eleanor you can't fib down the past that way mamma and i met you in the luxembourg gardens in broad daylight wearing puffed blue velveteen trousers with a bottle of wine in one pocket and a loaf of bread in the other let the dead past bury its dead he pleaded i go to an english tailor on the corso now marcia copley wrote that she was very much pleased with you but she didn't tell us how good-looking you were said margaret still frank paul reddened a trifle as he repudiated the charge with a laughing gesture don't you think miss copley's nice pursued margaret you'd better think so she added for she's one of our best friends paul reddened still more as he replied indifferently that miss copley appeared very nice he hadn't seen much of her of course i hope said his aunt that you have been polite my dear aunt he objected patiently i really don't go out of my way to be impolite to people and he took the baedeker from her hand and sat down beside her what places do you want to see first he inquired they were soon deep in computations of the galleries ruins and churches that should be visited in conjunction and half an hour later paul and margaret in one carriage with mrs royston and eleanor in a second were trotting toward the Colosseum, while paul was reflecting that the path of duty need not of necessity be a thorny one during the next week or so villa vivalanti saw little more of marcia than of her uncle she spent the greater part of her time in rome visiting galleries and churches with studio teas and other lenten relaxations to lighten the rigour of sight-seeing paul dessart proved himself an attentive cicerone and his devotion to duty was not unrewarded the dim crypts and chapels the deep embrasured windows of galleries and palaces afforded many chances for stolen scraps of conversation and paul was not one to waste his opportunities the spring was ideal rome was flooded with sunshine and flowers and the italian joy of being alive the troubles of italy's paupers which mr copley found so absorbing received during these days little consideration from his niece marcia was too busy living her own life to have eyes for any but happy people she looked at italy through rose-coloured glasses and italy basking in the spring sunshine smiled back sympathetically one morning an accident happened at the villa and though it may not seem important to the world in general still as events turned out it proved to be the pivot upon which destiny turned gerald fell over the parapet landing eight feet below butter side down with a bleeding nose and a broken front tooth he could not claim this time that marietta had pushed him over as it was clearly proven that marietta at the moment was sitting in the scullery doorway smiling at francois in consequence marietta received her wages a ticket to rome and fifty lira to dry her tears a new nurse was hastily summoned from castel vivalanti she was a niece of domenico the baker and had served in the household of prince barberini at palestrina which was recommendation enough as to the broken tooth it was a first tooth and shaky at that most people would have contented themselves with the reflection that the matter would write itself in the course of nature but mrs copley who perhaps had a tendency to be over solicitous on a question involving her son's health or beauty decided that gerald must go to the dentist's gerald demurred and marcia who had previously had no thought of going into rome that afternoon offered to accompany the party for the sake she said of keeping up his courage in the train as they were preparing to start 
she informed mrs copley that she thought she would stay with the roystons all night since they had planned to visit the forum by moonlight some evening and this appeared a convenient time in the roman station she abandoned gerald to his fate and drove to the hotel de londres et paris she found the ladies just sitting down to their midday breakfast and delighted to see her it developed however that they had an unbreakable engagement for the evening and the plan of visiting the forum was accordingly out of the question no matter said marcia drawing off her gloves i can come in some other day it's always moonlight in rome and they settled themselves to discussing plans for the afternoon the hotel porter had given margaret a permesso for the royal palace and stables and being interested in the domestic arrangements of kings she was insistent that they visit the quirinal but mrs royston who was conscientiously bent on first exhausting the heavier attractions set forth in Bedeker, declared for the latter in museum the matter was still unsettled when they rose from the table and were presented with the cars of paul dessart and m adolphe benoit paul's voice settled the question the city was too full of pilgrims for any pleasure to be had within the walls why not take advantage of the pleasant weather to drive out to the monastery of tre fontane but the matter did not eventually arrange itself as happily as he had hoped since he found himself in one carriage and marcia in the other at the monastery the monks were saying office in the main chapel when they arrived and they paused a few minutes to listen to the deep rise and fall of the gregorian chant as it echoed through the long bare nave the dim interior the low monotonous music the unseen monks made an effective whole paul awake to the possibilities of the occasion did his best to draw marcia into conversation but she was tantalizingly unresponsive the guide-book in mrs royston's hands and the history of the order appeared to absorb her whole attention fortune however was finally on his side mrs royston elected to stop on their way back to the city at st paul's without the walls and the whole party once more alighted within the basilica mrs royston guide-book in hand commenced her usual conscientious inspection while eleanor and the young frenchman strolled about commenting on the architecture margaret had heard that one of the mosaic popes in the frieze had diamond eyes and she was insistently bent on finding him marcia and paul followed her a few minutes but they had both seen the church many times before and both were at present but mildly interested in diamond-eyed popes the door of the cloisters stood ajar and they presently left the others and strolled into the peaceful enclosure with its brick-flagged floor and quaintly twisted columns it was tranquil and empty with no suggestion of the outside world they turned and strolled down the length of the flagging where the shadow of the columns alternated with gleaming bars of sunshine the sleepy old world atmosphere cast its spell about them marcia's tantalizing humour and paul's impatience fell away they walked on in silence until presently the silence made itself awkward and marcia began to talk about the carving of the columns the flowers in the garden the monks who tended them paul responded half abstractedly and he finally broke out with what he was thinking of a talk they had had that afternoon several weeks before in the borghese gardens most men wouldn't care for this he nodded toward the prim little garden with its violets and roses framed in by the pillared cloister and higher up by the dull grey walls of the church and monastery but a few do since that is the case why not let the majority mine their coal and build their railroads and the very small minority who do care stay and appreciate it it is fortunate that we don't all like the same things for there's a great variety of work to be done of course he added i know well enough i'm never going to do anything very great i don't set up for a genius but to do a few little things well isn't that something they had reached the opposite end of the cloisters and paused by one of the pillars leaning against the balustrade you think it's shirking one's duty not to live in america he asked i don't know marcia smiled vaguely i think perhaps i'm changing my mind i only know of one thing he said in a low tone that would make me want to be exiled from italy marcia had a quick foreboding that she knew what he was going to say and for a moment she hesitated then her eyes asked what is that paul looked down at the sun-barred pavement in silence and then he looked up in her face and smiled steadily if you lived out of italy marcia received this in silence while she dropped her eyes to the effigy of a dead monk set in the pavement and commenced mechanically following the latin inscription there was still time she was still mistress of the situation by a laugh and adroit turn she could overlook his words could bring their relations back again to their normal footing 
but she was by no means sure that she wished to bring them back to their normal footing she felt a sudden quite strong curiosity to know what he would say next hang it marcia he exclaimed i suppose you want to marry a prince or something like that a prince she inquired why a prince oh it's what you women are always after having a coronet on your carriage door with all the servants bowing and saying si si excellenza every time you turn around it would be fun she agreed do you happen to know of any desirable unmarried princes there aren't any no why i met one the other day that i thought was quite charming his family is seven hundred years old and he owns two castles and three villages he wouldn't stay charming you'd find the castles damp and the villages dirty and the prince stupid he dropped his hand over hers where it rested on the balustrade you'd better take me marcia in the long run you'll find me nicer marcia shook her head but she did not draw away her hand really paul i don't know and there's nothing i hate so much in the world as making up my mind you shouldn't ask such unanswerable things look mamma aren't the cloisters lovely margaret's voice suddenly sounded across the little court oh there are marcia and paul over there we wondered where you had disappeared to oh the deuce paul exclaimed as he put his hands in his pockets and leaned back against the pillar i told you he added with a laugh that my family always arrived when they were not wanted they all strolled about together and marcia scarcely glanced at him again but her consciousness was filled with his words and it required all her self-possession to keep up her part of the conversation as they started on mrs royston suggested that they stop a second time at the english cemetery just within the gate marcia looking at her watch saw with a feeling of relief that she would have to go straight on if she were to catch mrs copley and gerald in time for the six o'clock train bidding them good-bye at the porta san paolo she hastily and emphatically refused paul's proposition to drive to the station with her no indeed mr dessart she called out as he was making arrangements with mrs royston to meet later at the hotel i don't want you to come with me i shouldn't think of taking you away my aunt will be at the station and i am perfectly capable of getting there alone really i don't want to trouble you he put his foot on the carriage step it's no trouble he smiled no no i would rather go alone i shall really be angry if you come she insisted in a low tone the young man shrugged and removed his foot from the step as you please he returned in a tone which carried an impression of slightly wounded feelings the driver looked back expectantly waiting for his directions paul hesitated a moment and then turned toward her again as if inquiring the way is there any hope for me he said she looked away without answering there's no other man he added quickly marcia for a second looked up in his face no she shook her head there's no other man he straightened up with a happy laugh then i'll win he whispered and he shook her hand as if on a compact stazione he called to the driver and as the carriage started marcia glanced back and nodded toward the roystons with a quick smile for paul end of chapter seven read by celine major chapter eight of the wheat princess this librivox recording is in the public domain ah sybert you're just the man i wanted to see melville came up the walk of the palazzo occupied by the american ambassador as sybert emerging from the door paused on the top step to draw on his gloves in that case the latter returned it's well you didn't come five minutes later or i should have been lost to the world for the afternoon what's up nothing serious can you spare a few moments talk i won't take up your time if you're in a hurry not in the least i'm entirely at your disposal nothing on for the afternoon and i was preparing to loaf the two turned back into the house and crossed the hall to the ambassador's private library melville closed the door and regarded his companion a trifle quizzically sybert dropped into a chair indicated another and pushed a box of cigars and some matches across the table then he looked up and caught melville's expression well what's up he asked again the consul general selected a cigar with some deliberation bit off the end and regarded it critically while his smile broadened i have just returned from the mass meeting of the foreign residents he remarked that should have been entertaining it was he admitted there was some spirited discussion as to the best way of suppressing the riots 
and how did they decide to do it they have appointed a committee of course a committee sybert laughed and what is the committee to do wait on the ministers and invite them to reconstruct their morals ask the king to spend a little less money on the soldiers uniforms and a little more on their rations the committee said melville is to raise money for food and to assist the government as far as possible in quieting the people and suppressing the agitators ah breathed sybert and he added with his eye on the young man i have the honour of informing you that you were made chairman oh the devil this is not an official notification he pursued blandly but i thought you'd like to hear the news who's at the bottom of this why in heaven's name didn't you stop them i couldn't very well i was chairman of the meeting sybert's usual easy nonchalance had vanished he rose to his feet and took one or two turns about the room i don't see why i should be shoved into it i wish some of these officious fools would go back home where they belong i won't serve on any such committee i'll be hanged if i will i'll resign nonsense sybert you can't do that it would be too marked people would think you had some reason for not wanting to serve it was very natural that your name should have occurred for the position you have lived in rome longer than most of us and are supposed to understand the conditions and to be interested in good government it puts me in a mighty queer position i don't see why the elder man's tone had grown cool they naturally took it for granted that you as well as the rest of us will want to have the riots suppressed and choke off any latent tendencies toward revolution in this precious populace it was the work of a lot of damned busybodies who wanted to see what i would do melville suppressed a momentary smile however he remarked i see no reason why you should be so reluctant about serving in a good cause i don't suppose you wish to see a revolution any more than the rest of us heavens no it wouldn't do any good the government's got the army to back it the revolutionists would only be sent to the galleys for their trouble and the police oppression would be worse than ever he swung up and down the room a couple of times and then pausing with his hands in his pockets stared moodily out of the window melville smoked and watched him a shade of uneasiness in his glance just what position lawrence sybert occupied in rome what unofficial position that is was a mystery to the most of his friends melville understood him as well as any one with the exception of howard copley but even he was at times quite unprepared for the intimate knowledge sybert displayed in affairs which on the surface did not concern him sybert was distinctly not a babbler and this tendency toward being closed-mouthed had given rise to a vast amount of speculative interest in his movements he carried the reputation among the foreign residents of knowing more about italian politics than the premier himself and he further carried the reputation whether deserved or not of mixing rather more deeply than was wise in the dark undercurrent of the government and this particular spring of the undercurrent was unusually dark and dangerously swift young italy had been sowing wild oats and the crop was ripening fast it was a period of anxiety and disappointment for those who had watched the country's brave struggle for unity and independence thirty years before victor emmanuel cavour and garibaldi had passed away the patriots had retired and the politicians had come in a long period of over-speculation of dishonesty and incompetence of wild building schemes and crushing taxes had brought the country's credit to the lowest possible ebb a series of disgraceful bank scandals involving men highest in the government had shaken the confidence of the people the failure of the italian colony in africa and the heart-rending campaign against king menelik and his dervishes with thousands of wounded conscripts sent back to their homes had carried the discontent to every corner of the kingdom and fast on the heels of this disaster had come a failure in the wheat crop with all its attendant horrors while simultaneously the corner in the american market was forcing up the price of foreign wheat to twice its normal value it was a time when priests were recalling to the peasants the wrongs the church had suffered a time when the socialist presses were turning out pamphlets containing plain truths plainly stated a time when investors refused to invest in government bonds and even italian statesmen were beginning to look grave to the casual eyes of tourists the country was still as picturesquely raggedly gay as ever 
they were perhaps more beggars on the church steps and their appeal for bread was a trifle more insistent but for people interested only in italy's galleries and ruins and shops the changes were not marked but those who did understand who cared for the future of the nation who saw the seething below the surface were passing through a phase of disillusionment and doubt and lawrence sybert was one who both understood and cared he saw the direction in which the country was drifting even better perhaps than the italians themselves he looked on in a detached more remote fashion not so swept by the current as those who were in the stream but if he were detached in fact by accident of his american parentage and citizenship in feelings he was with the italians heart and soul the consul-general remained some minutes silently studying the younger man's expressive back irritation obstinacy something stronger appeared in every line of his squared shoulders then he rose and walked across to the window see here sybert he said bluntly i'm your friend and i don't want to see you doing anything foolish i know where your sympathies are and if the rest of us looked into the matter with our eyes open it's possible ours would be on the same side but that's neither here nor there we couldn't do any good and you can't either you must think of your own position you are secretary of the american embassy and nephew of the ambassador in common decency it won't do to exhibit too much sympathy with the enemies of the italian government you say yourself that you don't want to see a revolution then it's your duty in the interests of law and order to do all you can to suppress it oh i'm willing to do all i can toward relieving the suffering and quieting the people but when it comes to playing the police spy and getting these poor devils jailed for twenty years because they've shouted down with savoy i refuse melville shrugged that part of the business can be left to the secret police they're capable of handling it i don't doubt that sybert growled your business is merely to aid in pacifying the people and to raise subscriptions for buying food you are in with the wealthy foreigners and i can get money out of them easier than most i suppose that means i am to bleed copley i dare say he'll be willing enough to give it's in his line of course he's a friend and i don't like to say anything i know he had nothing to do with getting up the wheat deal but it's all in the family and he won't lose by it the corner is playing the deuce with italy and it's his place to help a bit what is playing the deuce with italy is an extravagant government and crushing taxes and dead industries the wheat famine is bad enough but that isn't the main trouble and you know it as well as i do the main trouble his companion broke in sharply is the fact that the priests and the anarchists and the socialists and every other sort of meddling malcontent keep things so stirred up that the government is forced into the stand it takes sybert whirled around from the window and faced him with black brows and a sudden flaring of passion in his eyes he opened his mouth to speak and then controlled himself and went on in a quiet half-sneering tone i suppose the socialists and priests and the rest of your malcontents forced our late premier into office and kept him there i suppose they yoked italy with the triple alliance and drove the soldiers into abyssinia to be butchered like hogs i suppose they were at the bottom of the bank scandals and put the charity money into official pockets and let fifteen thousand peasants go mad with hunger last year fifteen thousand his voice suddenly broke and he half turned away good lord melville the poverty in italy is something appalling yes i dare say it is but just the same that's only one side of the question the country is new and you can't expect it to develop along every line at once the government has committed some very natural blunders but at the same time it has accomplished a vast amount of good it has united a lot of chaotic states with different traditions and different aims into one organic whole it has built up a modern nation with all the machinery of modern civilization in an incalculably short time of course the people have had to pay for it with a good many deprivations in every great political change there are those who suffer it's inevitable but the suffering is only temporary and the good is permanent you've been keeping your eyes so closely on passing events that you're in danger of losing your perspective sybert shrugged his shoulders with a quick resumption of his usual indifference we've had twenty-five years of united italy and what has it accomplished he demanded it's built up one of the finest standing armies in europe if you like 
a lot of railroads it didn't need some aqueducts and waterworks and a postal and telegraph system it has erected any number of gigantic public buildings of theatres and arcades and statues of victor emmanuel the second but what has it done for the poor people beyond taxing them to pay for these things what has it done for sicily and sardinia for the pelagra victims of the north for the half-starved peasants of the agra romana why does sicily hold the primacy of crime in europe why has emigration reached two hundred thousand a year parliament votes five million lira for a palace of justice and lets a man be murdered in prison by his keepers without the show of a trial the government supports plenty of universities for the sons of the rich but where are the elementary schools for the peasants certainly italy's a great power if that's all you want and her people can take their choice between emigrating and starving yes it's bad i know but that it's quite as bad as you would have us believe i doubt you're a pessimist by conviction sybert you won't look at the silver linings the silver linings are pretty thin he retorted italian politics have changed since the days of victor emmanuel and cavour that's only natural you could scarcely expect any nation to keep up such a high pitch of patriotism as went to the making of the united italy the country settled down a bit but the elements of strength are still there the country settled down a good bit he agreed oh yes i believe myself at least i hope that it's only a passing phase the italian people have too much inherent strength to allow themselves to be mastered long by corrupt politicians but that the country is in pretty low water now and that the breakers are not far ahead no one with his eyes open can doubt the parliament is wasteful and senseless and dishonest the taxes are crushing the public debt is enormous the currency is debased if such a government can't take care of itself i don't see that it's the business of foreigners to help it that is just the point sybert the government can take care of itself and it will the foreigners out of common humanity ought to help the people as much as they can sybert appeared to study melville's face for a few moments then he dropped his eyes and examined the floor this is a time for those in power to choose their way very carefully there are a good many discontented people and the government is going to have more of a pull than you think to hold its own there's revolution in the air melville faced him squarely for goodness sake sybert i don't know how much influence you have or anything about it but do what you can to keep things quiet of course the government has made mistakes as what government has not but until there's something better to be substituted there's no use kicking plainly the people are too ignorant to govern themselves and the house of savoy is the only means of salvation sybert waved his hand impatiently i haven't been trying to undermine the government i assure you i know well enough that for a good many years to come italy won't have anything better to offer and all my influence with the italians which naturally isn't much has been advice of the same nature i know very well that if any radical change were attempted only anarchy would result so i counsel these poor starving beggars patience like a skulking coward very well i don't see then why you have any objection to keeping on with your counsel and at the same time give them something to eat it's the looks of the thing standing up openly on the side of the authorities when i'm not with them in sympathy it's a long sight better for a person in your position than standing up openly against the authorities oh as for that i'm thinking of resigning from the legation and then i'll be free to do as i please melville laid his hand on the younger man's shoulder sybert you may resign from the legation but you're still your uncle's nephew you can't resign from that whatever you did would cast discredit on him he's an old man and he's fond of you don't be a fool an american has no business mixing up in these italian broils italy must work out her own salvation without the help of foreigners garibaldi was right italia farà da se italia farà da se he repeated i suppose it's true enough italy must in the end do for herself and no outsider can be of any help but i shall at least have tried my dear fellow if you will let me speak plainly the best thing you can do for yourself and your family for america and italy is as you say to resign from the legation and go home go home sybert raised his head with a little laugh but with a flash underneath of the real self which he kept so carefully hidden from the world 
i was born in italy i was brought up here just as little gerald copley is being brought up i have lived here all my life except for half a dozen years or so while i was being educated all my interests all my sympathies are in italy and you ask me to go home i have no other home to go to if you take italy away from me i'm a man without a country i'm in earnest sybert whether you like it or not you're an american and you can't get away from it if you live here a hundred years you may talk italian and look italian but you cannot be italian a man's nationality lies deeper than all externals you're an american through and through and it's a pity you can't be a little proud of the fact the only way in which there's going to be any progress in the world for a good long time to come is for italians to care for italy and americans for america we aren't ready just yet to do away with national boundaries and if we were we should run up against racial boundaries which are still more unchangeable america is quite as good a country to care about as italy there are some who think it's better it depends on the point of view oh that's true enough sybert returned with a short laugh everything in the world depends on one's point of view the worst place is all right if you only choose to think so i dare say hell would be pleasurable enough to a salamander but the point is i'm not a salamander melville shrugged his shoulders helplessly and turned back to his seat there's no use arguing with you i know that you're wasting your ability where it isn't appreciated but i suppose it's nobody's business but your own some day you'll see the truth yourself and i hope it won't be too late but now as to this committee business for your uncle's sake you ought to carry it through i will tell you frankly i imagine it isn't news that the italian government has its eye on you and if you manage to get yourself arrested rightly or wrongly for stirring up sedition it will make an ugly story in the papers the editor and staff of the grido del popolo were arrested this morning the police are opening telegrams and letters and watching suspicious persons you'd better step carefully sybert laughed with a gesture of dissent <laughs> there's no danger about me the enthusiastic head of the foreign relief committee is safe from government persecution you'll act then oh i don't know i'll think it over it's a deuced hole to have got into though i suppose it is as you say about the only way to help no doubt i can raise money and distribute bread as well as another appoint copley on a subcommittee he'll be glad to give i don't like to ask him he doesn't go in for alms he's all for future though in a time like this in a time like this we're all willing to step aside a bit i'm glad you've decided to work on the side of the government it is as things stand the only sensible thing to do i haven't decided yet and i do not as i told you before care a rap what becomes of the government it's the people i'm helping it amounts to the same thing not in italy oh very well you're incorrigible at least keep your opinions to yourself i'm not likely to shout them abroad under the present regime and as to this infernal committee oh well i'll think about it very well think favourably it's the only way to help remember and very good policy into the bargain some day my boy maybe you'll grow sensible good-bye sybert paced up and down the room for five or ten minutes after melville had left and then picked up his hat and started out again turning toward the piazza barberini he strode along scowling unconsciously at the passers-by he bowed mechanically to the people who bowed to him along the corso he met the procession of carriages going toward the pincio ladies nodded graciously they even half turned to look after him but he was quite unaware of it his thoughts were not with the portion of roman society which rode in carriages he traversed the corso and plunged into the tangle of more or less dirty streets on the left bank of the tiber here the crowds who elbowed their way along the narrow sidewalks were more poorly dressed after some twenty minutes walking he turned into a narrow street in the region of the grimy ruins of the theatre of marcellus and paused before the doorway of a wine-shop which bore upon its front the ambitious title osteria del popolo italiano tarquinio paterno with a barely perceptible glance over his shoulder he stepped into the dingy little cafe which opened from the street the front room with its square wooden tables and stiff-backed chairs was empty 
except for madame tarquino paterno who was sweeping the floor sybert nodded to her and crossing the room to the rear door which opened into the cucina knocked twice the door opened a crack for purposes of examination and then was thrown wide to admit him the room which was revealed was a stone-walled kitchen lighted in the rear by a small paned window opening on to a gloomy courtyard lighted is scarcely the word to use for between the dirt on the panes and the dimness of the court very little daylight struggled in but the interior was not dreary a charcoal fire blazing on the high stone hearth shot up fiercely every now and then throwing grotesque highlights on the faces of the men grouped about the room sybert paused on the threshold and glanced about from face to face three or four men were sitting on low benches about a long table drinking wine and talking the one who was in the act of speaking as sybert appeared in the door paused with his mouth still open the others recognizing him however called out a cordial buona sera signor siberti while tarquino hastened to place a chair and bring a tall rush-covered flask of red frascati wine sybert returned their salutations and sat down with a glance of inquiry at the excited stranger tarquino ceremoniously presented him as girolamo mendamo of naples and he ended his introduction with the assurance have no fear he is a good fellow and one of us and left it to be conjectured as to whether the compliment referred to sybert or the neapolitan the latter took it to refer to sybert and after a momentary hesitation picked up his discourse where he had dropped it ah and when the poor fishermen are sickening for a little salt and try to get it from the sea-water without paying what do the police do they throw them into prison the camorra used to protect people from the police but now the camorra no longer dares to lift its head and the people have no protectors it used to be that when the police wanted more money it satisfied them to raise the taxes but now they must raise the price of bread and macaroni as well he had commenced in a low tone but as he proceeded his voice rose higher and higher and last week a great crowd broke open the bakeries and carried off the flour and the police were frightened and put down the price but not enough then the people threatened again an echo all the tax was taken off that is the way to deal with the police they are cowards and it is only fear that makes them just the man laughed hoarsely and looked around for approval the others nodded ja he speaks the truth it is only fear that makes them just they are cowards cowards repeated the neapolitan if all the people in every city of italy would do the same there would be soon no more taxes and no more police i am afraid that you are mistaken there my friend sybert broke in there will always be taxes and always be police but it's true as you say that the taxes are too heavy and the police are unjust the time hasn't come though when you can gain anything by rioting and revolutions the government's backed by the army and it's too strong for you you may possibly frighten it into lowering the wheat tax for a time but it will be at a mighty heavy cost to the ones who are found out who are you the man demanded suspiciously i am an american who would like to see italy as happy and prosperous and well governed as the united states sybert smiled inwardly at the ideal he was holding up ah uh, you're a spy the man cried with a quick scowl i am so far from being a spy that i have come to warn you that if you don't want to spend the next few years of your lives in prison you must be very careful to cheer the house of savoy on the first of may the police spies are keeping both eyes open just now the others nodded their heads specifically but the neapolitan still scowled he suddenly leaned forward across the table and scanned sybert with eyes that glittered fiercely in the firelight then he burst out again in low guttural tones it is easy for you to talk signor whatever your name is you have bread to eat but if you worked all day from sunrise to sunset worked until you grew so tired you couldn't sleep and then got up and worked again and then if the police came and took away all the money and taxes and didn't even leave enough to buy your family food and the work gave out so you must either steal or die and you couldn't find anything to steal then you would sing another song wait wait you say it's always wait will better times ever come if we sit down and wait for them who will give us the better times the king perhaps umberto the man broke off with a harsh laugh ah we shall die waiting and our children after us 
and when we are dead the good god will keep us waiting outside of paradise because there is no money to pay for masses no one cares for those who do not care for themselves it's the poor people who haven't enough to eat who buy the gold braid on the king's clothes and pay for the carriages of his ministers in my opinion we would do better to buy bread for our children first sybert looked back in the man's burning face and his own caught fire he knew that every word he said was true and he knew how hopeless was his remedy what could these passionate ignorant peasants blazing with rage do with power if they had it worse than nothing their own condition would only be rendered more desperate than ever he glanced about the table from one face to another they were all leaning forward waiting for his answer the fierce eagerness in their eyes was contagious a sudden wave of hopeless pity for them swept him off his feet and for a moment he lost himself my god men he burst out i know it's true i know you're starving while others spend your money there's no justice for you and there never will be the only thing i want in the world is to see italy happy i am as ready to die for it as you are but what can i do what can any one do the soldiers are stronger than we are and if we raise our hands they will shoot us down like dogs and there it will end he paused with a deep breath and went on in a quieter tone patience is poor food to offer to starving men but it's the only hope now for you and for italy the only thing you can do is to go to the polls and vote for honest ministers ministers are all alike said one and who will feed us while we are waiting for election day asked another who had been listening silently the question was unanswerable and sybert sat frowning down at the table without speaking the neapolitan presently broke in again there was something electric about his words and the forest behind them every one bent forward to listen who is the king he demanded he is only a man so am i a man then what makes him so different from me they may shoot me down if they like but first i have work to do the king shall know me before i die and he is not all he added darkly do you know why the wheat's so scarce because of a forestier here in rome signor copley he that put down the camorra in naples and throws the beggars into prison an angry mutter ran around the room you're mistaken there sybert interrupted it's not this signor copley who bought the wheat it's his brother in america this signor copley is the friend of the poor people many many thousand lira he gives away every year and no one knows about it a more friendly murmur arose but the neapolitan was still unconvinced it is the same signor copley he affirmed stubbornly he hides the wheat in america where he thinks no one will know about it and then after stealing it all from the mouths of the poor he gives a little back with a great show thinking to blind us but we know the grido del popolo printed it out in black and white for all who can to read and the grido del popolo was stopped this morning and the editor put in jail for printing lies said sybert sharply ah you're a police spy you pretend to be for us to make us talk his hand half instinctively went to his belt sybert rose to his feet and dropped his hand roughly on the man's shoulder the best thing you can do for your country is to put that stiletto into the fire he turned aside with an expression of disgust and tossed some silver coins on the table in payment for the wine then pausing a moment he glanced about the circle of swarthy faces gradually his expression softened i've tried to warn you the police are on the watch and i should advise you to stick pretty closely to your homes and not mix up in any riots i will do what i can to get food and money for the poor people i know of no other way to help heaven knows i would do it if i could he nodded to them and motioning tarquino to follow passed into the front room closing the door behind them he turned to the innkeeper tarquino i think you had better go up into the hills and attend to your vineyard for a few weeks the young italian's face was the picture of dismay but the osteria signor siberti who will manage that your wife can look after it let it be given out that you are tending vines in the sabine hills that is the safest profession these days the police will be paying you a visit before long if i am not greatly mistaken and whatever you do keep out fellows like that neapolitan <laughs> 
tarquinio's face darkened with a quick look of suspicion i am but a poor innkeeper signor siberti i must welcome those who come sybert shrugged i was merely speaking for your own safety such guests are dangerous addio he turned toward the door and then turned back a moment take my advice tarquinio and visit your vineyard tarquinio followed him to the threshold and bidding him a voluble good-bye in the face of the world begged the signor americano to honour his humble osteria again so that any chance passer-by might regard the gentleman as but a casual visitor sybert smiled at the simple strategy an italian loves a plot better than his dinner and is never happier than when engaged in an imaginary intrigue but in this case it occurred to him that his host's caution might not be out of place and he fervently assured tarquino that the wine had been excellent and that in the future he would send his friends to the osteria del popolo italiano End of chapter eight chapter nine of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain sybert turned away from the wine-shop with a half laugh at tarquinio's little play with a half frown at the fierce words of the neapolitan which were still ringing in his head he walked along with his eyes upon the ground scarcely aware of his surroundings until an excited medley of voices close at hand suddenly startled him from his thoughts he glanced up for a moment with unseeing eyes and then with an astonished flash of recognition as he beheld marcia copley backed against one of the dark stone arches in the substructure of the theatre of marcellus her head was thrown back and there were two angry red spots in her cheeks while a struggling crowd of boys pressed around her with shouts and gesticulations as he paused to take in the meaning of the scene he heard marcia evidently so angry that she had forgotten her italian say in english you beasty little cowards you wouldn't dare hurt anything but a poor animal that can't hit back she accompanied this speech with a vigorous shake to a small boy whom she held by the shoulder the boy could not understand her words but he did understand her action and he kicked back vigorously the crowd laughed and began to close around her she took out her purse who owns this dog she demanded at sight of the money they pressed closer and in another moment would have snatched it away but sybert stepped forward and raising his cane scattered them right and left what in the world are you doing here what is the meaning of this he asked oh mr sybert i'm so glad to see you look those horrible little wretches were killing this dog sybert glanced down at her feet where a bedraggled cur was crouching shivering and looking up with pleading eyes the blood was running from a cut on its shoulder and a motley assortment of tin was tied to its tail by a cord he took out his knife and cut the dog loose and marcia stooped and picked it up take care miss marcia he said in a disgusted tone he's very dirty and you will get covered with blood marcia put her handkerchief over the dog's wound and it lay in her arms whimpering and shaking what is the meaning of this he demanded again almost roughly what are you doing in this part of the city alone his tone at another time would have been irritating but just now she was too grateful for his appearance to be anything but cordial and she hastily explained i've been spending the afternoon at trefontaine with some friends i left them at the english cemetery and was just driving back to the station when i saw those miserable little boys chasing this dog i jumped out and grabbed him and they all followed me i see said sybert and it is fortunate that i happened by when i did or you wouldn't have had any money left to pay your cab driver these roman urchins have not the perfect manners one could wish manners marcia sniffed indignantly i loathe the italians i think they are the cruellest people i ever saw those boys were stoning this poor dog to death i dare say they have not enjoyed your advantages they would have killed him if i hadn't come just when i did you are not going out to the villa alone no aunt catherine and gerald are going to meet me at the station oh very well he answered in a tone of evident relief as they turned toward the waiting carriage let me take the dog and i will drop him a few streets farther on where the boys won't find him again certainly not said marcia indignantly some other boys would find him i shall take him home and feed him he doesn't look as if he had anything to eat for weeks in that case said sybert resignedly i will drive to the station with you 
for he is scarcely a lapdog and you may have trouble getting him into the train and while she was in the midst of her remonstrance he stepped into the carriage and put the dog on the floor between his feet the dog however did not favour the change and stretching up in an appealing paw he touched marcia's knee with a whine you poor thing stop trembling nobody's going to hurt you and she bent over and kissed him on the nose marcia was excited she had not quite recovered her equanimity since the scene with paul de sart in the cloisters and the affair of the dog had upset her afresh she rattled on now with a gaiety quite at variance with her usual attitude towards sybert of anything and everything that came into her mind gerald's broken tooth the departure of marietta the afternoon at tre fontane and the episode of the dog sybert listened politely but his thoughts were not upon her words he was too full of what he had left behind in the little cafe for him to listen patiently to marcia's chatter as he looked at her flushed and smiling in her dainty clothes which were faultless with the faultlessness that comes with money he experienced a feeling almost of anger against her he longed to face her with a few plain truths what right had she to all her useless luxuries when her father was as the neapolitan had truly put it taking his money from the mouths of the poor it was their work which made it possible for such as she to live and was she worth it the world had given her much she was educated she was cultured she had trained tastes and sensibilities and in return what did she do for the world she saved a dog he made a movement of disgust and for a moment he almost obeyed his impulse to throw the dog out but he brought himself back to reason with a half laugh it was not her fault she knew nothing of her father's transaction she knew nothing of italy's need there was no reason why she should not be happy and after all he told himself wearily it was a relief to meet some one who had no troubles marcia suddenly interrupted her own light discourse to look at her watch gracious i haven't much time will you please tell him to hurry a little mr sybert the driver obeyed by giving his horse a resounding cut with the whip whereupon marcia jerked him by the coat-tails and told him that if he whipped his horse again she would not give him any mancha the fellow shrugged his shoulders and they settled down into a walk isn't there any society for the prevention of cruelty to animals she asked these italians are hopeless you can scarcely expect them to expend more consideration on animals than they receive themselves sybert threw off oh dear she complained anew suddenly becoming aware of their pace i'm afraid we'll be late for the train don't you suppose he could hurry just a little without whipping the horse sybert translated her wishes to the driver again and they jogged on at a somewhat livelier rate but by the time they reached the station the train had gone and there were no mrs copley and gerald in the waiting-room marcia's face was slightly blank as she realized the situation and her first involuntary thought was a wish that it had been paul de sart instead of sybert who had come with her she carried off the matter with a laugh however and explained to her companion i suppose aunt Catherine thought i had decided to stay in the city with the roystons i told her i was going to but i found they had a dinner engagement it doesn't matter though i'll wait here for the next train there is one for palestrina before very long aunt Catherine went by way of tivoli thank you very much mr sybert for coming to the station with me and really you mustn't think you have to wait until the train goes the dog will be company enough sybert consulted his time schedule in silence the next train doesn't leave till seven and there won't be any carriage waiting for you how do you propose to get out to the villa oh the station man of palestrina will find a carriage for me there's a very nice man who's often driven us out sybert frowned slightly as he considered the question it was rather inconvenient for him to go out to the villa that night but he reflected that it was his duty toward copley to get his niece back safely as to letting her set out alone on a seven-mile drive with a strange palestrina driver that was clearly out of the question i think i'll run out with you he said looking at his watch she had seen his frown and feared some such proposition no indeed she cried i shouldn't think of letting you i've been over the same road hundreds of times and i'm not in the least afraid it won't be late the sabine mountains are infested with bandits he declared i think you need an escort mr sybert how silly i know your time is precious this was intended for irony but as it happened to be true he did not recognize it as such and i don't want you to come with me sybert laughed 
i don't doubt that miss marcia but i'm coming just the same i am sorry but you will have to put up with me i should a lot rather you wouldn't she returned but do as you please thank you for the invitation he smiled there's about an hour and a half before the train goes you might run out to the embassy and have a cup of tea thank you for the invitation but i think i'll stay here i don't wish to miss a second train and i shouldn't know what to do with the dog very well if you don't mind staying alone i will drive out myself and leave a business message for the chief and then i can take a vacation with a clear conscience i have a matter to consult your uncle about and i shall be very glad to run out to the villa he raised his hat in a sufficiently friendly bow and departed when he returned an hour later he found marcia feeding the dog with sausage amid an appreciative group of porters one of whom had procured the meat oh dear she cried i hoped marcellus would have finished his meal before you came back but you aren't so particular about etiquette as a contessa she added and don't object to feeding dogs in the station i dare say the poor beast was hungry hungry i had a whole kilo of sausage and you should have seen it disappear these facchini look as if they would not be adverse to sharing his meal poor fellows they do look hungry marcia produced her purse and handed them a lira apiece because i haven't any luggage for you to carry and because you like my dog she explained in italian don't tell uncle howard she added in english i don't believe one lira can make them paupers it would doubtless be difficult to pauperize them any more than they are at present he agreed you don't believe in uncle howard's ideas of charity do you she inquired tentatively oh not entirely but we don't quarrel over it perhaps he suggested we'd better go out and find an empty compartment while the guards are not looking i fear they might object to marcellus is that his name occupying a first-class carriage marcellus because i found him by the theatre ah i hope he will turn out as handsome a fellow as his namesake come marcellus it's time we were off he picked the dog up by the nape of the neck and they started down the platform looking for an empty carriage they had their choice of a number the train was not crowded and the first-class carriages in an italian way train are rarely in demand as he was helping marcia into the car sybert was amused to see tarquinio the proprietor of the inn of the italian people hurrying into a third-class compartment with a furtive glance over his shoulder as if he expected every corner to be an ambuscade of the secret police the warning had evidently fallen on good ground and the poor fellow was fleeing for his life from the wicked machinations of an omniscient premier if you will excuse me a moment i wish to speak to a friend sybert said as he got marcia settled and without waiting for her answer he strode off down the platform she had seen the young italian weighed down by a bundle tied up in a bed quilt give a glance of recognition as he passed them and as she watched sybert enter a third-class compartment she had not a doubt but that the italian was the friend he was searching she leaned back in the corner with a puzzled frown why had sybert so many queer friends in so many queer places and why need he be so silent about them End of chapter 9chapter ten of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain sybert presently returned and dropped into the seat opposite marcia the guard slammed the door and the train pulled slowly out into the campagna they were both occupied with their own thoughts and as neither found much pleasure in talking to the other and both knew it they made little pretence at conversation marcia's excited mood had passed and she leaned forward with her chin in her hand watching rather pensively the soft roman twilight as it crept over the campagna what she really saw however was the sunlit cloister of st paul without the walls and paul de sart's face as he talked to her was she really in love with him she asked herself or was it just italy she did not know and she did not want to think it was so much pleasanter merely to drift and so very difficult to make up one's mind everything had been so carefree before why must he bring the question to an issue it was a question she did not wish to decide for a long long time would he be willing to wait to wait for an indefinite future that in the end might never come patience was not paul's way suppose he refused to drift suppose he insisted on his answer now did she wish to give him up no quite frankly she did not 
she pictured him as he stood there in the cloister with the warm sunlight and shadow playing about him with his laughing boyish face for the instant sober his eager insistent eyes bent upon her his words for once stammering and halting he was very attractive very convincing and yet she sighed life for her was still in the future the world was new and full and varied and experience was beckoning there were many things to see and do and she wanted to be free the short southern twilight faded quickly and a full moon took its place in a cloudless turquoise sky the light flooded the dim compartment with a shimmering brilliancy and outside it was almost dazzling in its glowing whiteness marcia leaned against the window gazing out at the rolling plain the tall arches of aqua felice were silhouetted darkly against the sky and in the distance the horizon was broken by the misty outline of the sabine hills now and then they passed a lonely group of farm buildings set in a cluster of eucalyptus trees planted against the fever but for the most part the scene was barren and desolate with scarcely a suggestion of actual breathing human light on the appian way were visible the gaunt outlines of latin tombs and occasionally the ruined remains of a medieval watch-tower the picture was almost too perfect in its beauty it was like a painted backdrop for a spectacular play scarcely real and yet one of the oldest things in the world the rolling campagna the arches of the aqueducts rome behind and the sabines before so it had been for centuries thousands of human lives were wrapped up in it that was its charm the picture was not inanimate but pathetically human as she looked far off across the plain so mournfully beautiful in its desolation a sudden rush of feeling swept over her a rush of that insane love of italy which has engulfed so many foreigners in the waters of lethe she knew now how paul felt italy italy she loved it too a half sob rose in her throat and her eyes filled with tears she caught herself quickly and shrank back in the corner with a glance at the man across to see if he were watching her he was not he sat rigid looking out at the campagna under half-shut eyelids one hand was plunged deep in his pocket and the other lay on the dog's head to keep him quiet marcia noticed in surprise that while he appeared so calm his fingers opened and shut nervously she glanced up into his face again he was staring at the picture before him as impassively as at a blank wall but his eyes seemed more deep-set than usual and the under shadows darker she half abstractedly fell to studying his face wondering what was behind those eyes what he could be thinking of he suddenly looked up and caught her gaze i beg your pardon he asked i didn't say anything you looked as if you did he said with a slight laugh and turned away from the light and now marcia had the uncomfortable feeling that from under his drooping lids he was watching her she turned back to the window again and tried to centre her attention on the shifting scene outside but she was oppressively conscious of her silent companion his face was in the shadow and she could not tell if his eyes were open or shut she tried to think of something to talk about but no relevant subject presented itself she experienced a nervous sense of relief when the train finally stopped at palestrina the station man after some delay found them a carriage with a reasonably rested looking horse as sybert helped marcia in he asked if she would object to letting a poor fellow with an unbeautifully large bundle sit on the front seat with the driver we won't meet any one at this time of night he added he's going to castel vivalanti and it's a long walk certainly he may ride marcia returned it makes no difference to me whether we meet any one or not oh i beg your pardon sybert smiled i didn't mean to be disagreeable some ladies would object you know tarquinio he called as the italian with the bed quilt shuffled past the signorina invites you to ride since we are going the same way tarquinio thanked the signorina with italian courtesy boosted up his bundle and climbed up after it marcellus stretched himself comfortably in the bottom of the carriage and with a canine sigh of content went peaceably to sleep they set out between moonlit olive orchards and vineyards with the familiar daytime details of farm buildings and ruins softened into a romantic beauty behind them stretched the outline of the alban mountains the moonlight catching the white walls of two twin villages which crowned the heights and before them rose the more desolate sabines standing fold upon fold against the sky it was for the most part a silent drive 
sybert at first aware that he was more silence than politeness permitted made a few casual attempts at conversation and then with an apparently easy conscience folded his arms and returned to his thoughts marcia too had her thoughts and the romance of the flower-scented moonlit night gave them their direction had paul been there to urge his case anew italy would have helped in the pleading but paul had made a tiny mistake that day he had taken her at her word and let her go alone and the tiniest of mistakes is often big with consequences once sybert shifted his position and his hand accidentally touched marcia's on the seat between them pardon me he murmured and folded his arms again she looked up at him quickly the touch had run through her like an electric shock who was this man she asked herself suddenly what was he underneath he seemed to be burning up inside and she had always considered him apathetic indifferent she looked at him wide-eyed she had never seen him like this he reminded her of a suppressed volcano that would burst out some day with a sudden explosion she again set herself covertly to studying his face his character seemed an anomaly it contradicted itself was it good or bad simple or complex marcia did not have the key she put together all the things she knew of him all the things she had heard the result was largely negative the different pieces of evil cancelled each other she knew him in society he was several different persons there but what was he when not in society in his off hours this afternoon for example why should he be so at home by the theatre of marcellus it was a long distance from the embassy and the man on the front seat who was he she suddenly interrupted the silence with a question sybert started as if he had forgotten she was there she repeated it is that man on the front seat tarquinio paterno who keeps a little trattoria in rome yes he returned bringing a somewhat surprised gaze to rest upon her how do you come to know his name oh i just guessed i know domenico paterno the castel vivalanti baker and he told me about his son tarquinio it's not such a very common name so when you said this man was going to the village and when i heard you call him tarquinio i thought why were you surprised she broke off is there anything more to know about him you seem to have his family history pretty straight sybert shrugged they lapsed into silence again and marcia did not attempt to break it a second time when they came to the turning where the steep road to castel vivalanti branches off from the highway the driver halted to let tarquinio get out but marcia remonstrated that the bundle was too heavy for him to carry up the hill and she told the man to drive on up to the gates of the town they jogged on up the winding ascent between orchards of olive and almond trees fringed with the airy leafage of spring above them the clustering houses of the village clung to the hilltop tier above tier the jagged skyline of roofs and towers cut out clearly against the light marcia had never visited castel vivalanti except in the unequivocal glare of day which shows the dilapidated little town in all its dilapidation but the moonlight changes all the grey stone walls stretched above them now like some grim fortress city of the middle ages and the old round tower with its ruined drawbridge looked as if it had seen dark deeds and kept the secret it was just such a stronghold as the cenci was murdered in they came to a stand before the tall arch of the porta della luna while tarquinio was climbing down and hoisting the bundle to his shoulder marcia's attention was momentarily attracted to a group of boys quarrelling over a game of moro in the gateway suddenly in the midst of tarquinio's expressions of thanks to the signorina for helping a poor man on his journey a frightened shriek rang out in a child's high voice followed by a succession of long-drawn screams the moro players stopped their game and looked at each other with startled eyes and then after a moment of hesitation went on with the play at the first cry sybert had leaped from the carriage and seizing one of the boys by the shoulder he demanded the cause the boy wriggled himself free with a gesture of unconcern gervasio delano's mother is beating him he always makes a great fuss because he is afraid what is it marcia cried as she sprang from the carriage and ran up to sybert some child's mother is beating him the two without waiting for any further explanations turned in under the gate and hurried along the narrow way to the left in the direction of the sounds people had gathered in little groups in the doorways and were shaking their heads and talking excitedly one woman as she caught sight of marcia and sybert 
called out reassuringly that teresa wasn't hurting the boy he always cried harder than he was struck by the time they had reached the low doorway whence the sounds issued the screams had died down to hysterical sobs they plunged into the room which opened from the street and then paused it was so dark that for a moment they could not see anything the only light came from a flickering oil lamp burning before an image of the madonna but as their eyes became accustomed to the darkness they made out a stoutly built peasant woman standing at one end of the room and grasping in her hand an ox goad such as the herdsmen on the campagna use for a moment they thought she was the only person there until a low sob proclaimed the presence of a child who was crouching in the farthest corner what do you want the woman asked scowling angrily at the intruders have you been striking the child with that goad sybert demanded i strike the child with what i please the woman retorted he is lazy good for nothing and he stole the soup marcia drew the little fellow from the corner where he was sobbing steadily with long catches in his breath his tears had gained such a momentum that he could not stop but he clung to her convulsively realizing that a deliverer of some sort was at hand she turned him to the light and revealed a great red welt across his cheek where one of the blows had chanced to fall it's outrageous the woman ought to be arrested said marcia angrily sybert took the lamp from the wall and bent over to look at him poor little devil he looks as if he needed soup he muttered the woman broke in shrilly again to say that he was eleven years old and never brought in a single saldo she slaved night and day to keep him fed and she had children enough of her own to give it to whose child is he sybert demanded he was my husband's the woman returned and that husband is dead and i have a new one the boy is in the way i can't be expected to support him for ever it is time he was earning something for himself marcia sat down on a low stool and drew the boy to her what can we do she asked looking helplessly at sybert it won't do to leave him here she would simply beat him to death as soon as our backs are turned i'm afraid she would he acknowledged of course i can threaten her with the police but i don't believe it will do much good he was thinking that she might better adopt the boy than the dog but he did not care to put his thoughts into words i know she exclaimed as if in answer to his unspoken question i'll take him home for an errand boy he will be very useful about the place tell the woman please that i'm going to keep him and make her understand that she has nothing to do with him any more would mrs copley like to have him at the villa sybert inquired doubtfully it's hardly fair oh yes she won't mind if i insist and i shall insist tell the woman please sybert told the woman rather curtly that she need not be at the expense of feeding the boy any longer the signorina would take him home to run errands the woman quickly changed her manner at this and refused to part with him since she had cared for him when he was little it was time for him to repay the debt now that she was growing old sybert succinctly explained that she had forfeited all right to the child and if she made any trouble he would tell the police who he added parenthetically were his dearest friends without further parleying he picked up the boy and they walked out of the house followed on the woman's part by angry prayers that apoplexies might fall upon them and their descendants curious groups of people had gathered outside the house and they separated silently to let them pass at the gateway the moral players stopped their game to crowd around the carriage with shrill inquiries as to what was going to be done with gervasio the driver leaned from his seat and stared in stupid bewilderment at this rapid change of fares but he whipped up his horse and started with dispatch apparently moved by the belief that if he gave them time enough they would invite all castel vivalanti to drive as they rattled down the hill sybert broke out into an amused laugh i fear your aunt won't thank us miss marcia for turning villa vivalanti into a foundling asylum she won't care when we tell her all about it said marcia comfortably she glanced down at the thin little face resting on sybert's shoulder poor little fellow he looks hungrier than marcellus the woman said he was eleven and he's scarcely bigger than gerald sybert closed his fingers around gervasio's tiny brown wrist he's pretty thin he remarked but that can soon be remedied these peasant children are hardy little things when they have half a chance he looked down at the boy who was watching their faces with wide-open excited eyes half frightened at the strange language you mustn't be afraid gervasio he reassured him in italian the signorina is taking you home with her to villa vivalanti where you won't be whipped any more and will have all you want to eat 
you must be a good boy and do everything she tells you gervasio's eyes opened still wider will the signorina give me chocolate he asked he's one of the children i gave chocolate to and he remembers it marcia said delightedly i thought his face was familiar yes gervasio she added in her very careful italian i will give you chocolate if you always do what you are told but not every day because chocolate is not good for little boys you must eat bread and meat and soup and grow big and strong like like signor siberti here sybert laughed and marcia joined him i begin to appreciate aunt catherine's anxiety for gerald do you suppose there is any danger of malaria at villa vivalanti for the rest of the drive they chatted quite gaily over the adventure sybert for the first time dismissed whatever he had on his mind and as for marcia st paul's cloisters were behind in rome as they turned into the avenue the lights of the villa gleamed brightly through the trees see si, gervasio said sybert that is where you are going to live gervasio nodded too odd to speak presently he whispered shall i see the little principino the little principino what does he mean marcia asked the little principino with yellow hair gervasio repeated gerald sybert laughed the principino is good for a free-born american ah and here is the old prince he added as the carriage wheels grated on the gravel before the loggia and copley stepped out from the hall to see who had come hello is that you sybert he called out in surprise and marcia i thought you had decided to stay in town what in the deuce have you brought with you a boy and a dog o oh prince said sybert as he set gervasio on his feet miss marcia must plead guilty to the dog but i will take half the blame for the boy gervasio and marcellus were conveyed into the hall and it would be difficult to say which was the more frightened of the two marcellus slunk under a chair and whined at the lights and gervasio looked after him as if he were tempted to follow mrs copley attracted by the disturbance appeared from the salon and a medley of questions and explanations ensued gervasio meanwhile sat up very straight and very scared clutching the arms of the big carved chair in which sybert had placed him we thought he might be useful to run errands sybert suggested as they finished the account of the boy's maltreatment poor child said mrs copley we can find something for him to do he is small but he looks intelligent i have always intended to have a little page or he might even do as a tiger for gerald's pony cart no aunt catherine expostulated marcia i shan't have him dressed in livery i don't think it's right to turn him into a servant before he's old enough to choose the position of a trained servant is a much higher one than he would ever fill if left to himself he is only a peasant child my dear he is a psychological problem she declared i am going to prove that environment is everything and heredity is nothing and i shan't have him dressed in livery i found him and he's mine at least half mine she glanced across at sybert and he nodded approval i will turn my share of the authority over to you miss marcia since it appears to be in such good hands marcia shall have her way said mr copley we'll let gervasio be an unofficial page and postpone the question of livery for the present he can play with gerald she suggested we were wishing the other night that he had someone to play with and gervasio will be just the person it will be good for his italian i suspect that gervasio's italian may not be useful for drawing-room purposes her uncle laughed i shall send him to college she added her mind running ahead of present difficulties and prove that peasants are really as bright as princes if they have the same chance he'll turn out a genius like like crispy heaven forbid exclaimed sybert but he examined marcia with a new interest in his eyes we can decide on the young man's career later copley suggested he seems to be embarrassed by these personalities gervasio with all these august eyes upon him was on the point of breaking out into one of his old-time wails when mrs copley fortunately diverted the attention by inquiring if they had dined neither mr sybert nor i have had any dinner marcia returned and i shouldn't be surprised if gervasio has missed several but marcellus under the chair there has had his she added mrs copley recalling her duties as hostess a jangling of bells ensued pietro appeared and stared at gervasio with as much astonishment as is compatible with the office of butler mrs copley ordered dinner for two in the dining-room and for one in the kitchen 
and turned the boy over to pietro's care oh let's have a meet with us just for to-night marcia pleaded you don't mind do you mr sybert he's so hungry i love to watch hungry little boys eat marcia expostulated her aunt in disgust how can you say such things the child is barefooted since my own son and heir is banished from the dinner-table i object to an unwashed alien's taking his place copley put in gervasio will dine with the cook to gervasio's infinite relief he was led off to the kitchen and consigned to the care of francois who later in the evening confided to pietro that he didn't believe the boy had ever eaten before marcia's and sybert's dinner that night was an erratic affair and quite upset the traditions of the copley menage to pietro's scandalization the two followed him into the kitchen between every course to see how their protege was progressing gervasio sat perched on a three-legged stool before the long kitchen table his little bare feet dangling in space an ample towel about his neck while an interested scullery maid plied him with viands he would have none of the strange dishes that were set before him but with an expression of settled purpose on his face was steadily eating his way through a bowl of macaroni it was with a sigh that he had finally to acknowledge himself beaten by the copley larder marcia called bianca marietta's successor and bade her give gervasio a bath and a bed bianca had known the boy in his pre villa days and if anything was more wide-eyed than pietro on his sudden promotion as marcia was starting upstairs that night sybert strolled across the hall toward her and held out his hand how would it be if we declared an amnesty he inquired at least until gervasio is fairly started in his career she glanced up in his face a second surprised and then shook her head with an air of scepticism we can try she smiled but i am afraid we were meant to be enemies her room was flooded with moonlight she undressed without lighting her candle and slipping on a light woolen kimono sat down on a cushion beside the open window she was too excited and restless to sleep she leaned her chin on her hand with her elbow resting on the low window-sill and let the cool breeze fan her face after a time she heard some one strike a match on the loggia and her uncle and sybert came out to the terrace and paced back and forth talking in low tones she could hear the rise and fall of their voices and every now and then the breeze wafted in the smell of their cigars she grew wider and wider awake and followed them with her eyes as they passed and repassed in their tireless tramp at the end of the terrace their voices sank to a low murmur and then by the loggia they rose again until she could hear broken sentences sybert's voice sounded angry excited almost fierce she thought her uncle's low decisive half contemptuous once as they passed under the window she heard her uncle say sharply don't be a fool sybert it will make a nasty story if it gets out and nothing's gained she did not hear sybert's reply but she saw his angry gesture as he flung away the end of his cigar the men paused by the farther end of the terrace and stood for several minutes arguing in lowered tones then to marcia's amazement sybert leaped the low parapet by the ilex grove and strove out across the fields while her uncle came back across the terrace alone entered the house and closed the door she sat up straight with a quickly beating heart what was the matter could they have quarrelled was sybert going to the station surely he would not walk she leaned out of the window and looked after him a black speck in the moonlit wheat-field no he was going toward castel vivalanti why castel vivalanti at this time of the night had it anything to do with gervasio or perhaps tarquino the baker's son she recalled her uncle's words don't be a fool it will make a nasty story if it gets out perhaps people's suspicions against him were true after all she thought of his look that night in the train what was behind it and then she thought of the picture of him in the carriage with the little boy in his arms a man who was so kind to children could not be bad at heart and yet if he were all that her uncle had thought him why did he have so many enemies and so many doubtful friends the breeze had grown cold and she rose with a quick shiver and went to bed she lay a long time with wide open eyes watching the muslin curtains sway in the wind she thought again of paul dessart's words in the warm sleepy sunlit cloister of the little crowd of ragamuffins chasing the dog of her long silent ride with sybert <laughs>
of the moonlit gateway of castel vivalanti with the dark high walls towering above her thoughts were growing hazy and she was almost asleep when mingled with a half-waking dream she heard footsteps cross the terrace and the hall door opened softly End of chapter ten read by celine major